Collins, we're back and ready to hand it over to our friends at the American Kidney Fund today. Take it away. Thank you, Cash, and I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Mike Spigler. I am the Interim Vice President of Patient Services and Kidney Disease Education for the American Kidney Fund. Uh, we are a uh, national nonprofit based here in Rockville, Maryland that serves as the entire country, and uh, I'll walk you through a little bit of kind of what we're going to do today. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, more about the American Kidney Fund, our programs and services that we have. I'll do a bit of a Kidney 101 um, in case you're uh, not really quite sure exactly what the kidneys do and what it's all about and why kidney disease is an important thing for you to learn about. Uh, we'll talk some about the uh, risk factors associated with kidney disease and the causes, you know, who is more at risk. Um, we'll just talk about some of the tests that are available to screen for kidney disease uh, and what the treatment options are should you find someone that has kidney disease. Uh, we'll talk about some of the disparities that we have seen and that the research has shown uh, with some of the different disproportionately affected groups in the country um, and how those uh, disparities also affect their, their treatment uh, outcomes. I'll also cover how you can help us. We need your help. Um, you know, while we're a national nonprofit, uh, the only way we can achieve our national goals or to work with folks that have boots on the ground, and you guys could be a huge uh, help uh, in that endeavor. Um, and I'll talk about those different things you see on the screen that you can help us with. Um, we'll, and then we'll finally we'll wrap up with some questions and answers, so feel free to send us your questions throughout the presentation, and uh, we have time at the end. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So a little bit about the American Kidney Fund. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but quite simply, our, our vision is to help people fight kidney disease and help live healthier lives. We were founded in 1971 by uh, some friends and family members of uh, about a dozen or so patients who did not have any financial resources to pay for dialysis treatment. Uh, back in the early 70s, there, were, there was no insurance coverage for uh, treatment whatsoever. So um, if you needed, if went to kidney failure, uh, unless you had a vast financial resources at first, there was no way to pay for treatment and stay alive. Um, for the few machines that were available, um, there were actually panels of folks that were helping people choose who got dialysis and who didn't. Uh, these group of folks got together to raise money for their friends and family members, their neighbors, um, and out of that we've grown from just helping a few uh, dozen patients up to 84,000 patients last year, about one in every five dialysis patients. So uh, kind of leading to this next slide, the main thing that we do, and that was really the, the core and the history of why we did this, was our financial assistance programs. Um, you'll see them all listed there. Our biggest one is something called HIP, which stands for Health Insurance Premium Program. Uh, it's a program that helps people pay for their insurance. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but a lot of folks that end up on um, dialysis are going three or four times a week. They're not able to continue working. They would lose their health insurance if not for us being able to help pay for it. Um, uh, we also help with things like Medigap policies, Medicare Part B premiums, uh, lots of different things to help people maintain their insurance. We have a safety net program that helps with things like transportation to dialysis appointments, paying for a blood pressure cuff, uh, things like that that they need just to maintain their care. We have a uh, prescription assistance program as well, which helps with direct medication to patients as well through some pharmacy partners. Um, we have a summer enrichment program, which assists uh, children with special needs that are on dialysis uh, or have some other kidney disease that needs, you know, wants to go to sleep away camp. Um, but needs to go to a place that has a dialysis facility there. We help pay for the tuition for them to do that. And, you know, uh, heaven forbid there is a disaster that hits, uh, we have the ability to turn a, a pretty vast that disaster relief program that can help not only individual patients but help dialysis centers get back on their feet. Um, this was something we really turned on uh, during Hurricane Sandy, as an example. It's probably the most recent major event that we did. Um, but it can help even for a small event if you happen to be in a rural area. Uh, say, rural Oklahoma and a tornado or something would hit uh, and knock out the only dialysis center in an area, we can help those patients find other care at other centers. So um, if you have any dialysis patients that you see um, on a regular basis, there's lots of different financial assistance programs we can help with. Of course, like most other national nonprofits, we do uh, advocacy and policy work as well uh, to raise the moniker of kidney disease and to try to get more research for the disease. Uh, compared to other disease states, the funding for kidney disease is, is really, really uh, pathetic. Um, we have strategic alliances, like the one we've uh, done here with the Community Action Partnership, to help, again, spread our message and try to spread uh, our program reach as much as we can. 
Um, and then uh, a lot of things I'll talk about in the later part of this presentation today, health education and disease prevention. I won't go into all of these now, but really just um, ways in which preventing people from getting dialysis in the first place. So give you a quick slide. Uh, I talked a little bit about the 84,000 patients. This is a, our impact slide. 84,000 patients last year, that's about one in five U.S. dialysis patients received at least some funding from us. Uh, we did screenings in 22 cities last year um, where we're screening for diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney disease. Um, and every two minutes, uh, we are helping uh, someone with some kind of a financial assistance. Uh, for a kidney disease. So you can see, kind of see the heat map there. Again, we're all over the country. Um, our biggest state by far that we help is Texas, but really every, every um, state and every territory we've sent grants to. So now that you've heard about kidney fund, let me give you a little bit of an overview of the kidneys and what they do. Um, most people know that the kidneys make urine, but that may be where the understanding ends. Um, everyone has two kidneys, you can see in the picture here. Um, not only does it remove waste and extra fluid from the blood and put it into urine, the kidney also controls your body's chemical balance. And that is something that a lot of people don't know about. Um, your, body, your kidneys are really an amazing organ, and when they start to shut down, there are lots of things that can start to go wrong. Your sodium balance goes off, your potassium balance goes off. Um, both of those are quite dangerous because their electrolytes and can affect the way that your muscles work, how your heart beats. Um, uh, your phosphorus levels go off, which can affect things like your bone density. Um, and the other thing that the kidneys do, you know, high blood pressure can cause kidney disease, but because they also release hormones that control high blood pressure, when your kidneys get damaged, they actually can actually cause your blood pressure to become even worse. Um, and the last thing it does, it releases a hormone also that tells your red blood cell, it tells your uh, uh, bone marrow to make red blood cells so that you don't have anemia, so you have plenty of oxygen in your blood. So you can see when the kidney's healthy balance gets off, there are lots of different things that go wrong, and there's a cascading effect throughout the body. So, and when something goes wrong with the kidneys, we call this chronic kidney disease, something that's it's permanent damage to the kidneys. It's not an acute case where something's caused by a virus or a bacteria. It's permanent damage to the kidneys, but it's usually not reversible. Um, you can slow or stop kidney disease progression, but you really cannot reverse it. There are usually no signs or symptoms, which makes this even scarier. Um, I'll probably reiterate this in the, in the slide several times today, but I'll say it first time here. Less than one in 10 people with kidney disease know that they have it. The number of people that we come across who uh, end up going to the emergency room because they're just feeling tired or weak or they pass out or uh, they just have a pain in their back, uh, and they're told at the emergency room that they need to start dialysis on Monday uh, is staggering. Uh, I can't reiterate enough that there are usually no signs or symptoms, not to scare everyone, um, but it, this is something you have to take seriously. You can't just assume because you're urinating like you always have that there's nothing wrong with your kidneys. Um, it really, it's something we have to consider, and I'll talk a little bit more later about that. Again, it can't be re reversed. Uh, it can only be uh, slowed. Uh, if it progresses, there are five stages of, of kidney disease. Um, the first is stage one, which is kind of uh, very slight damage, all the way up to what we call stage five, or kidney failure, or sometimes you'll hear it called end-stage renal disease, um, ESRD. When someone is in kidney failure, they must have some kind of treatment to live. You cannot function once you're in ESRD without some kind of a treatment. The two main treatments that are available uh, right now are dialysis or kidney transplant. They are not a cure. They never do really um, everything, you know, that you're back to normal again, you never have a worry again, but they are treatments for kidney failure. Just gives you kind of a sense, a uh, quick photo here just showing that, you know, when your kidney starts to become damaged, actually even the physical structure of it can start to become affected as well. You know, almost kind of see a shriveling effect uh, in, in this photo as well. Um, there are lots of things that can cause this um, and lots of secondary issues that can happen. The arteries or veins coming into out the kidneys can become damaged, um, blocked. Um, you know, heart disease can also cause some of those uh, vascular issues uh, to happen in the kidney. Your kidney is made up of tiny, tiny little blood vessels and capillaries. Um, and so when your blood pressure is off, it doesn't take much for your kidneys to start to become damaged with those tiny little, very fragile uh, capillaries in there. So I've talked about, I've uh, hinted around what some of the main causes are, but you can see here the two main causes by far 
uh, the giant uh, navy blue uh, pie piece that you see there, maybe hard to read on, on the screen, uh, is uh, diabetes. Uh, that is over 40% of the cases of kidney failure. Um, by far and away, the biggest uh, cause of folks that are on dialysis or gotten a transplant is diabetes. And the second main cause is high blood pressure. That accounts for another one in four. So if you put the two of those together, you're almost about three out of every four patients um, that are on uh, dialysis got there because of either diabetes or high blood pressure. Um, so you'll hear me say that over and over again because that's, that's a big part of what we do here and kind of our prevention efforts is to not only try to stop people from progressing to kidney failure once they have kidney damage, but to try to identify those folks that are at risk so at least they know and they have a game plan and they can take this seriously so they're not caught off guard. Some of the other causes that you see there uh, are some genetic causes, um, diseases like polycystic kidney disease, um, but there can also be some things like HIV, AIDS, et cetera, that can also cause these as well. So you heard me talk about uh, why it's super important um, to get checked. I'll say it again. Less than one in 10 people with kidney disease know that they have it. Um, the best thing you can do for yourself is to know your risk. I'll go deeper dive into the risk in just a minute, but again, know that if you're at risk for diabetes, if, if you're at risk for high blood pressure. Check your body mass index. Obesity is not only a standalone factor uh, for kidney disease, but it also obviously affects diabetes and high blood pressure as well. One of the early tests for uh, kidney disease itself is a urine test. Um, we can actually look for tiny amounts of protein in your urine. Um, and the what, what reason why that's important in a way to think about that is if you think about your kidneys kind of like a pasta strainer or a colander with those little holes in, the kidneys keep the pasta in the colander and it lets the, the water out. When your kidneys start to become damaged, those holes don't really work the way they should and things fall through into the water, into the urine uh, that otherwise wouldn't. One of the first things that we start to see are tiny little pieces uh, of protein uh, that end up in your urine. You can also do a blood test. That's really probably the gold standard for measuring uh, kidney disease. There's a test called EGFR, which is a mouthful. It's an estimated glomerular filtration rate, if you can say that 10 times fast. But all that really means is how fast your kidneys filter your blood. Um, there's a formula that some scientists have put together, some researchers have put together, um, where you can actually test for um, how much of a certain uh, waste product in your blood uh, called creatinine is there. They put it into a formula with your age and your uh, your gender, your race, and it gives this, this estimated number of how fast your kidneys are filtering your blood. That's really the best test, and wherever that EGFR number puts you will drop you in being normal or one of those five stages of kidney disease that I talked about. And there's some secondary tests I won't go much into, blood urea, nitrogen, another uh, waste byproduct that stays in the blood, um, imaging tests, um, you know, things like CAT scans, um, and if there's some kind of a growth of the kidney uh, or some kind of a scarring issue, they can also do a kidney biopsy as well. So I mentioned this earlier, uh, there are really only two treatments for kidney failure, um, dialysis and kidney transplant. Um, I'm going to talk about each one in just a minute, a little bit uh, more in depth. Um, hemodialysis is probably what most people think of when you just hear the word dialysis. You picture someone kind of in a chair or a machine. That is by far and away the most common form. That's that big uh, navy blue part of the pie that you see on the screen there. Um, People that go to hemodialysis almost always do it in center, although there's a growing uh, body of research and also growing options for folks to do that kind of dialysis at home as well. But for folks to do the traditional kind of what we call in-center hemodialysis, they go to the clinic three to four times a week, and they're there three to five hours at a time. You add those numbers up, that's a lot of time um, that you're sitting in a dialysis chair not doing much. It's extremely hard to maintain a job with that kind of a a regimen that, that, that you're working in. Um, it's extremely tiring, um, and it, it, it's just hard to get to and from the center. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a full-time job pretty much in and of itself. Um, there are machines, though, now you can do it at home. You can sometimes do it at, at night as well called nocturnal hemodialysis. Um, the, that whole field is growing extremely rapidly. There's another type of dialysis called peritoneal dialysis, um, and I'll talk about both of these in a little bit before we get to even dive on this slide. Um, and kind of what that one's all about. And then, of course, is kidney transplant. So, again, you can kind of see uh, the red is the peritoneal and the, uh, the light blue is um, transplant. So you can kind of see the uh, disbursement of treatment options in the U.S. So hemodialysis. Um, 
it is, again, I can't stress this enough, it is a treatment for kidney disease. It is not a cure for kidney disease. It performs, um, basically, the machine performs, as you see there, there's a picture of a hemodialysis machine, performs a lot of the functions of the kidneys, but basically is outside of the body. Um, your blood moves through the machine. It's filtered across the membrane. The toxins, the extra fluid are pulled out. So at least that aspect of, of kidney disease is being treated. But the problem is, is that if you're doing this, uh, these kind of stops and starts three or four times a week, your body's building up fluid and toxins on the days that you're not at treatment. Suddenly you go to treatment, your body goes through this massive withdrawal of, of, the, of the toxins. Um, you kind of have a bit of a fatigue crash from that. Uh, you're feeling good for a little bit, and then you're back you know, in the same cycle over and over again. Um, so it's not kind of that constant uh, filtering that your body does as we're still sitting here listening and talking. Um, that your, your kidneys are always doing. It kind of really stops and starts. In addition, that's really where the dialysis treatment ends. I mean, it, it, it helps with the fluid, it helps with the toxins. What it does not help with uh, it, are doing some of the hormonal things that I talked about early on, uh, managing some of your electrolytes to some extent. The dialysis machine will do part of that, um, but there's still some things you have to control through diet and medication so that you don't have some of these nasty side effects that can come with dialysis as well. Um, Having said all this and kind of making this hemodialysis sound like this is a terrible, awful thing, I will say there are some patients that kind of get in a rhythm with it. They like it. I've known patients that have been on hemodialysis for 35 years um, or more. Um, and the, the, the facilities that treat these patients now have gotten so good. I, I just spoke to a company recently who is trying to create a kind of a spa atmosphere at some of their centers because a lot of these patients, their only time out of their house is really to come to the dialysis appointment. So, really trying to help build that kind of emotional, psychosocial aspect of hemodialysis. Uh, the other type, I won't go too much into this because it's really not um, as common as the other ones, um, but is a, certainly an adequate treatment for kidney disease as well, is something called peritoneal dialysis. It uses a membrane in the abdomen as a filter. So your body's actually own kind of abdominal lining is what becomes the filter. So instead of the dialysis machine doing it with a filter in there, it's, it's all the blood vessels and capillaries in your abdomen actually serves as the filter. So kind of a quote-unquote clean fluid uh, is pumped into the abdomen. You know, your blood kind of moves through, and it's just a process of basically diffusion where all the toxins are kind of move across that membrane into that fluid and pump back out of the body and fresh is put back in over the course of several hours, um, either overnight or multiple times a day, someone will do it. Um, you can do it manually, or there's machines that can do it as well. Um, that one's usually done every day and almost always exclusively done uh, at home. And then probably the one that probably most people are familiar with, maybe when you say what's the, what's the cure for kidney disease, would be a, a transplant. Um, you know, when I started working in kidney disease back in 2003, um, it didn't occur to me, you hear the word transplant, you think, okay, well, they take a kidney out, they put a new one in. I mean, that's to do with a heart transplant, right? Um, but they don't do that with the kidneys. You actually you keep the two in that are already there, and they bring the other one in along for the ride as well. The, the theory behind this is, is, you know, the other kidneys still might be working at 3 to 5 percent or so, so there's no reason to get rid of them. They're still doing some kind of a function, uh, not enough to really uh, keep you alive, but it's still enough to do something. So they keep them in there. There's no reason to take them out and they add the other healthy kidney in. It can come from a living donor. Uh, it can come from a deceased donor. Um, you know, I guess it was probably about 10 years or so ago now when they did the first paired exchange, which has really helped a little bit with the, uh, the transplant list. Um, so if, if you might not have a loved one that is a match for you as a donor, if they say, well, I still want to give a kidney, basically they put a formula together and they'll give a kidney to someone else, that person's loved one will give a kidney to you, that's the easiest way, but they've done it with over a dozen donors before in this complex paired exchange, and that's actually helped a lot with living donors who might not have a match from someone they know uh, specifically. It is not a permanent fix. You have to take anti-rejection meds for the rest of your life, um, and there's always the chance, unfortunately, that that kidney uh, could fail. So I want to talk a little bit about the kidney disease burden, and, you know, all the great work that you guys do in your CAAs, I want to make sure that, that you're kind of thinking about these things, if you have patients you come across that may be a dialysis patient or close to that or a caregiver for someone, just to kind of give you a sense of the breadth of this and, and, the, and the impact. It is the ninth leading cause of death in America. And I bet if I asked you before this, this 
call to write down what the top 10 causes are. I, I highly doubt that kidney disease would have uh, fallen in there unless you knew someone that you may have lost uh, from kidney disease. Um, there are some uh, research studies that are suggesting it could very easily climb to seven in the next few years. Um, so it is something that is uh, extremely important to the vast public health of the United States. We have 31 million people at least with kidney disease in America. And I'm going to say this stat again, nine out of 10 don't know that they have it. Um, there are people in stage three, stage four sometimes that have no idea they have any kidney issues because there are no symptoms. So this is a silent disease. Uh, we have over 600,000 people uh, that are either on dialysis or living with a kidney transplant in the United States. The number continues to grow. We've seen a little bit of a decrease in how fast that number's been growing, but it still continues to grow as the population grows. We have over 100,000 people on the waiting list for a kidney transplant. That number continues to grow. Average wait times four to five years. There's only about 13,000 transplants a year that happen in the United States for kidneys. So you can see at that rate, we're never going to really catch up. It is extremely important if you haven't already to sign up to become an organ donor, not just for those that need kidneys, but for all the life-saving organs that, that, that are out there. Um, the need is so, so great. Please consider becoming an organ donor. That's my, my one pitch for that as well uh, while we're here. And then, you know, one thing I want you, to, you, you folks to understand is, is the financial burden of this. Most patients in the U.S. Uh, will become eligible for Medicare regardless of their age. And so, in other words, what I mean by that, you don't have to be 65 to get Medicare. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, a lot of uh, folks that needed dialysis at first couldn't get it because there were no insurance companies covering it. The fastest way back in the 70s for them to get folks on some kind of care was to put it on a national coverage, so they actually dropped it into Medicare. Um, so now, if you have enough work credit to qualify for Medicare, Regardless of your age, you actually, if you go into kidney failure, you will qualify for Medicare early. That's the good, that's the good news. The bad news is that Medicare only pays for 80% of coverage. Um, we have some states which pay, patients have lots of difficulty getting things like Medicare Advantage plans, Medigap plans. There's a huge hole that they end up facing and, and paying for their coverage, the other 20%, which can be devastating. You have three appointments a week, tons of medications, transportation dialysis. Uh, the financial burden is staggering. Um, and that, that's a big, big area where the American Kidney Fund can help your patients and help your, your customers uh, that you see in the CAA if you run, run across anyone that's struggling to, to pay the bills uh, while on dialysis. So I, I jumped ahead a little bit there, but the, the uh, patient responsible for the remaining 20%, there are lots of different out-of-pocket costs. Again, one of the things we pay for more than anything else with our safety net program uh, is transportation. Um, some patients, if they do make so little that they qualify for Medicaid can sometimes get transportation services, but if you're kind of in that gray area where you've got Medicare, you don't quite have the um, uh, financial need to meet Medicaid, the, the taxi rides or the public transportation or paying for your car when you have no income really is, is extremely difficult. So understanding that, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, who's at risk for kidney disease. Um, Obviously, if you have diabetes, if you have high blood pressure, if you have a family history of chronic kidney disease, sister, brother, father, mother with kidney disease, you are at more risk yourself. Um, race or ethnicity also seems to have um, a, a harmful fa uh, factor in this, not necessarily in developing early kidney disease, but in progressing through those stages from stage one to five. Being African-American, Native American, Asian Pacific Islander, or Hispanic descent, you see much higher rates, which I'll talk about in a second, in progressing through to kidney failure. We don't really know why that is. Um, there are some theories, but we don't really know exactly why that is happening. And obviously, if you're over 60, with everything else, as I can attest to, as you get older, things start falling apart. Your kidneys are, may, are no exception. Uh, as you get older, if you're over 60, um, your, your kidneys usually start to see some kind of a de decline. Um, so being over 60 can put you at higher risk for kidney disease uh, as well. So you see here, um, only uh, this is the look. This is the, this is basically the percentage breakdown of, of the U.S. population, just as far as uh, as uh, racial disparity goes, so, uh, as uh, the racial makeup goes. You only got a 13% in the green there that are African Americans. 
But if you go to the next slide, um, you can see they make up for 32% of ESRD cases. Um, much, much, much higher rates in those populations um, than others. Again, we don't know why. It could be access to care issues. Um, it could be uh, diet. It could be some of the other complicating risk factors. African Americans um, are much higher risk for diabetes and high blood pressure. So you've kind of got the one-two punch uh, of those two risk factors complicating things. It may make it that you're kind of much more likely to progress through the stages than other groups. Here's some relative risk to show you. Uh, Ameri African Americans are th about three and a half times as likely as whites to develop kidney failure. Uh, Hispanics are about one and a half times as likely um, to develop it. Um, and even though, as I mentioned earlier, we've seen some decline in the rate of increase uh, in African Americans, Native Americans, uh, the prevalence rate is still much, much higher in these folks uh, than any other racial group. Uh, again, I mentioned um, the disparities by age as well. So this is just this is a slide just talks a little bit about um, kind of where we see that. Um, if you look on the left hand side of the screen, there the kind of maroon and the orange, um, those are folks that are 60 and up. So you can see a vast majority of those folks um, that have kidney failure fall into that age range. Um, I usually get a question here about what about kids on dialysis. You know, they don't, they don't, they didn't have diabetes or high blood pressure, how'd they get it? Um, fortunately, uh, dialysis or kidney failure in children are, are relatively rare. Um, and when it does happen, it's almost exclusively, exclusively because of some kind of a, a congenital defect or, or a hereditary disease um, that has caused it. Um, that being said, I mean, we still focus lots of programs on, on, on kids with, on dialysis as well. And, they're a huge focus for us, but um, just as far as pre prevention goes, there's not really anything pre preventative you can do uh, to keep kids off there. But that gives you a, a sense of kind of the age breakdown. So just kind of wrapping all this up together as far as the determinants of the disease, again, race, a huge factor. Um, if you're in a primarily African-American neighborhood, Hispanic neighborhood, um, this is something you need to be talking to your folks about. Um, if you have high rates of diabetes in your area, which is pretty much every area at this point, this is something you need to be talking about to the folks coming through your doors. And one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be working with all of you folks and, and CAP um, is that we need to get the, the word out to people of low socio socioeconomic status as well. They seem to have a greater burden of disease um, than others uh, with higher rates, uh, uh, higher SES numbers. Um, and combine that with of racial minorities, you have pretty much the, the perfect storm of uh, genetic risk factors, socioeconomic, socioeconomic risk factors coming together. Um, if you're in an impoverished neighborhood, uh, African-American neighborhood, Hispanic neighborhood, this is absolutely something you have to be talking to your folks about. Um, there is a, a bit of a geography distribution difference as well, just to, to close this section out. Uh, the southeastern U.S., um, and actually Texas as well, where that whole kind of diabetes belt, as they say, seems to be a much higher rate uh, for having kidney disease. Um, you've got counties in that region with diabetes rates more than 10 percent, obesity above 30 percent. Um, this all plays a part into that. Um, so um, you'll start to see as you think through this, if you're, if you're sitting at, uh, you know, a, a CAA in an impoverished neighborhood in Alabama, you should be, you know, taking a second look at this slide right now because that really is the crux of where these major problems are. Um, as far as the American Kidney Fund goes, just a, one other anecdotal piece, we give more money to Texas than any other state. Um, it's because we have so many patients in the state of Texas, so many that are facing financial difficulties. Um, those of you in Texas as well, this is something that we try to address every year by really focusing on the programs on Texas as well. But for those of you in the southeast, um, we'll bring this program to you next year as well, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. The other thing that we see, not only in disparities in disease rates, but our disparities in access to care. Uh, for some reason, the positions on the kidney transplant list are disproportionately occupied by whites, uh, despite having much, many more, a higher rate of African Americans on dialysis. Um, you know, we're not really sure exactly why that is. There's some thoughts of the research study that's listed here on the slide. 
um, that talks about what they propose and some of the things are. But these are just some of the different things they found. They're uh, referred for transplant less often. It, it takes longer for them to get through the transplant evaluation process. Um, doctors are less likely to place them on the waiting list at all. There's a longer wait for a donor kidney. Um, they have worse trans post-transplant outcomes. There's clearly some, an issue here that we're trying to address. One of the ways in which we're trying to do it, there's been a push over the last couple of years from a lot of the groups like Donate Life uh, to try to get more um, minorities to sign up to become organ donors. It would be a huge, huge help uh, um, to the field is if we could help move that process along. Uh, just to give you a sense of the numbers, uh, this was as of uh, last month. Um, you actually can go to a website, it's www.unos.org, U-N-O-S.org. You can actually see, I think it's just an hour or two behind, I think, every day, uh, the data. You actually write to the number exactly how many people are on the waiting list for various organs. This is just for kidneys, 101,181. That was as of about a month ago. And the great thing about this is, too, if you're curious, well, what does it look like in my area? You can actually go on that website uh, and break down um, how to do a rating at your particular hospital, uh, what age groups are there, what you can see uh, demographic characteristics of these folks. Um, it's a really, really great website for data. Um, that, uh, it's www.unos.org. So now that I've sufficiently scared you and try to set the stage, I'd love to ask for your help, um, and I'll give you some options on how you can help us do that. Four main things you can do right now. Number one is educate, um, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about that section, kind of get your thoughts on how we might be able to do that together uh, through the chat box in just a second. Uh, the second way would be to advocate, um, which I'll talk about in a second, to volunteer, uh, and obviously we are a, a charity uh, and fundraise as well. So we have one program that I want to talk about here, which is our Kidney Health Educator Program. It is a peer-to-peer -peer health education course. It's super simple, easy to use. Um, it's a completely free. I'll say that again, it's completely free. Not only the online training course, but all the materials. We replenish the materials. It is absolutely free. Um, it's a resource to you. I know, like us as a charity, you guys are probably strapped for cash as well. This is a great program you can very easily add to your uh, group of activities that you're doing that almost really no cost to you whatsoever. Um, to become a kidney health educator, you take a 30 to 40 minute online course uh, from the American Kidney Fund's website. The, the website is there, it's kidneyfund.org slash K-H-E. Um, once you complete that, that course, you answer five questions um, that I'm sure all of you would very easily pass, um, and then we send you a kidney disease prevention toolkit. It's in English and it's in Spanish. I'll talk about what's in it in a second. Um, and then I'll talk about how we, might, how we might be able to help you promote this if you choose to do it. But it's absolutely free. If you run out of materials, we send you more. Uh, couldn't be easier to do. So the next slide, I'll show you a little bit about what's in there. Again, it's kind of a lot of this. <laughs> we talk about a married kidney fund. We have a kidney 101 to kind of help people um, understand what's in there. Um, on the online course, we help you go through all the different materials that are in there. We give you some tips on how to use it and kind of help set the stage for what your role would be as a kidney health educator. You know, things like communicating back to us um, about how many people attended a class, getting feedback on, um, you know, what materials might be helpful to be added, what are the languages should we look at in the future, things like that. Again, we created this toolkit because we have 31 million Americans that have kidney disease. Nine out of 10 don't know they have it. I know you're probably tired of me saying that. I'm just going to keep saying it again. It's the one takeaway I want you to have today. Most people don't know that they have it because there's no symptoms. Um, if kidney disease is found and treated, there's something we can do about it. So this toolkit can help folks prepare for that. Um, people understand their, their risk factors. They'll know that there are screening tests. I mean, that's a big barrier that we found as well. Folks just, even just know that there is a test for kidney disease is something that they become interested in if they even know that it's there. Um, and then how to live uh, a healthy lifestyle. Those are all the things that someone will walk away with um, once they do this class. The toolkit is really for anybody. So if you've got anyone that comes to your CAA that have di has diabetes, high blood pressure, family history, all these risk factors I talk about, I guarantee you, you're all saying, okay, we've got at least one person that meets this criteria that are coming through our doors. This is really something that can help all of those different folks. So um, I'll talk about this in just a second, but I mean, it, it's, this is something I want you guys to, to think about as well is, 
you know, what other kind of classes or offerings are you doing already that you might be able to incorporate this program into? You know, are you doing any programs for, for seniors about financial management? Is there a way to do a little bit of a, a, a course or hand out something about kidney disease to those folks? Help us target these folks. Folks that they know that they're at risk, um, there's something they can do about it. Those are kind of the ways in which you can incorporate some of our materials into what you're already doing. In the toolkit, uh, you'll, there are lots of different ideas on how to do the course. Um, you can do this for one-on-one -on -one sessions. There's a flip chart that, that goes back and forth. What you see is kind of word for word of what to say. What the recipient sees are nice, super clean images that are easy to understand. Uh, there was a research study done a few years ago that actually looked at all the, the uh, kidney education materials from different nonprofits, uh, from CDC, uh, across the board. Uh, American Kidney Fund's materials were rated as the, most, the, the easiest to understand. Um, so we take pride in how easy this is for folks to understand if they have health literacy issues, if they have just literacy issues in general, a lot of images. It's really, really simple to understand language. Flyers on how to promote it. And after this slide, I'll stop and just ask you guys a question about that as well. Um, fact sheets you can hand out about different risk factors. Again, all replenishable in English and in Spanish. Um, and then if you are doing, if you happen to have a classroom setting, uh, we have access to a PowerPoint uh, projector, a PowerPoint setup. There's a CD of all the materials and PowerPoint slides as well. So you can do this for two people. You can do it for 200 people. Super easy to do. Uh, and then we have a, a stack of what we call kidney health trackers in those. Uh, toolkit as well. These are fold-out wallet cards that have all the typical tests for kidney disease in there, so people can kind of write in their lab values and monitor them through a couple different appointments. Again, we have tons of those that we're happy to replenish as well. Um, and, and even if there's some parts of this toolkit, if you take the course, you get this sent to you, you say, man, maybe I can't really use all this. If there's a component of this that you want to use, we're happy to even send you those materials as well. And then, of course, evaluation forms. Uh, and order forms. So as part of this next slide, one of the things I'd like to um, have you think about as I'm reading this slide, and then I'll pause to ask you a question, you know, how might you use this in, in, your, in your CAA? You know, uh, I'd love to get your thoughts of, you know, would it be helpful for us to have, to, to, and we're happy to create something as well. We really want this to be a partnership with all of you. Um, you know, if there's something that we don't have in that toolkit, it would be helpful. Is there a certain uh, way to integrate this in other uh, programs that you're doing? Is there a particular flyer or language, um, web ad, whatever we might be able to do to give you to help promote the Kidney Health Educator Program and Kidney Health Education at your CAA? I'd love if you would take some time in the chat box to, to put in any ideas. Um, we're happy to try to, to develop something on our own, but it, you know, it's so much better when we have your input to do that. <clears throat> So um, your role in this would be obviously to have educational sessions um, if, you're, if you can do that, again, one-on-one -on -one or large settings, and then send the evaluation form to us. That's really it. It's 100% free uh, to do this. <clears throat> These are some ideas that we have in the class that we want folks to be able to think about as they're, they're going out and doing um, sessions that, uh, through your CAA. Um, you know, from a personal level, any group or club you may be a part of, if there are local churches or places of worship that are nearby, those have been successful locations to do these events before. Family, friends, any local community centers, like your CAA would be a great one to do. Um, any one-on-one -on -one sessions, um, we've done, done these at family reunions, senior centers, cultural centers. A, a really successful one that we found are doing these uh, through workplaces as part of a kind of like a lunch and learn program, a brown bag program. That's been really successful successful in. Um, I should, should have said this earlier, but I'll say it now. Really, anyone can do this course, too. I mean, you don't have to be a medical professional to do this. We have patients that have done this. We have family members that have done this, uh, all the way up through nurses and doctors that have done this as well. Really, anyone can do this course. So um, I'd love any feedback you have on um, how you think you might be able to apply this and what might be able to do to help you do it. <clears throat> and, of course, this is just kind of a wrapping this up again. If you want some takeaway messages on what you can do right away uh, in your uh, local CAA, encourage folks to get regular checkups. Most of the time, uh, people don't know this is happening, but there are lots of different kidney checks that are being done through a typical kind of blood workup at your doctor's office. Get regular checkups. Look for high blood pressure. Look for diabetes. 
uh, educate about the importance of controlling blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol. I didn't go too much into it, but heart disease is also a standalone risk factor for kidney disease as well. So helping control some of the cardiovascular risks as well, like controlling cholesterol, is extremely important. Provide resources to help your community members follow a uh, low-fat, low-salt diet. We've got lots of great diet information on, on the American Kidney Fund website, which is kidneyfund.org. Promote exercise most days of the week. This is advice that I should probably take on myself, but I could, it probably goes for most of America. But exercise is really the magic drug for almost anything, uh, and kidney disease is no different. 30 minutes or more most days of the week will be life-changing for, for many of the folks that you serve. <clears throat> Educate about the negative effects of tobacco uh, and excessive, excessive alcohol use. Um, provide resources for tobacco cessation. I'm sure most of you probably already doing that to some extent uh, already. So <clears throat> I also talked about how you can advocate for kidney patients. If you're interested, we do have an advocacy network. Um, this can be as simple as just sending a petition to uh, a local representative um, about uh, something that's going on, if it, it, it's also as simple as we want more research from the CDC to try to find a cure for kidney disease. Would you offer your support behind this? Um, the, the more folks that we have kind of in that database as a number gives us more strength and kind of finally gets people's ears perking up on, on Capitol Hill and then local and, and state uh, governments. So it's absolutely something uh, to think about as well. There are volunteer opportunities. Um, we, as I mentioned, um, well, as I'll mention right now, we, we have screening events that we do across the United States as well. Uh, we have a signature program, which is the second bullet there, called Kidney Action Day. We do those at six cities across the country. We're doing those six cities across the country next year. Um, Birmingham, Philadelphia, D.C., uh, Chicago, Houston, and New Orleans. If you're in any of those metro areas, uh, we want, not only do we, would you, we love your volunteer help, we would love to have your CAA there at the event for free. We'll give you a community resource space to do that. Um, help us promote the event. There are committee opportunities available to you as well. Um, if you're in those six cities, um, which you can find, by the way, all of those on, you see the website there at the bottom, kidneyactionday.org. Um, if it's not up now, it will be very soon. Um, but those cities, we'd love your help. We you also host a screening. Uh, we can send you our forms. We can give you tips on how to do it, even if it's as simple as just a blood pressure screen. It's a huge, huge thing just to get people talking about kidney disease, understanding that there's a risk for kidney disease if they have high blood pressure. Uh, if you have the ability to do blood glucose, that's great too, but we can give you all the materials that you need to kind of market that and set that up, uh, and you can work with one of our great uh, members of our health initiatives team to do that. Um, but spread the word about screenings in your, in your own community. You'll have uh, three of our staff uh, content information at the end of this presentation. If you're interested in volunteering or having some kind of event uh, at your area, just let us know. Obviously, we're, very, we're limited as far as actual physical bodies go. We can't come out to screenings everywhere. Um, and we are a charity. As much as I wish we had an unlimited budget, we do have some budget constraints as well. Uh, but in addition to those six cities, we're in about another 20 cities across the country. We're happy to talk to you to see if you're in that area and if there's any kind of way we can collaborate together. Uh, we really want this to be uh, a, a bilateral uh, process. <clears throat> and of course, I won't talk too much about this piece, but we do have a new program called Kidney Nation. If you are interested in fundraising for the American Kidney Fund, there's lots of different ways you can do it. We've kind of moved, a lot of nonprofits are moving away from the old traditional walk model where everyone gets together, and we're opening up so people can do, honor folks and do programs in any way they see fit. Um, there's lots of really cool ideas uh, that, that you can find on our website. Um, with links to Kidney Nation. We've got folks that are doing lacrosse tournaments, role-playing events, so many different kinds of uh, things that people have been doing, um, runs, triathlons, um, to raise money as well. So again, I can't emphasize this enough. We need you. We need your help. You are the ones that have your fingers in the pulse of the community. As much as we try to do, we don't, but if you're things out there you're hearing, if there are kidney patients that you work with that are having particular challenges, I would love to hear from you. Um, you know, we're always trying to figure out what new and innovative programs we can do to help, um, and we want to build these collaborations not only with the, the national office here at CAP, but with all of your local CAAs as well. So we are always open to that. Um, and you have the power to reach people who are at risk. Talk about who those risk factors, what those risk factors are. Um, you certainly are coming across those folks every day, 
um, and together we can help save lives. So you've got my information there. Um, I kind of oversee all of these different programs that we talked about. John Manning uh, is the, our lead for alliances um, and also our exhibits, so his information is there as well. You know, if there's some kind of a more of a strategic long-term thing you would be interested in putting together with us, um, John would be that person. And any questions just about kidney disease in general or kidney health educator or some of the other programs I talked about, Heather Jordan, um, his information is there as well. She's our education manager. And with that, I will take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much to CAP and all of you for attending and listening to this. Great. Um, I don't have any questions that have come in um, as of this point, but um, if there's anything last minute, uh, go ahead and use that chat window on the right-hand side to go ahead and get those in. All else fails, you can always use any of the contacts that are up on the screen now or reach out to the Community Action Partnership and we'll be sure to uh, pass it along and get you connected. Any closing thoughts? No, again, I just thank you so much for having us, Katja. All right, then, thank you everyone and um, we will close out for today, thank you.